Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, you were, you are, and you will ever be faithful. Your promises are true. Your word stands forever. You never leave us nor forsake us. Father, great is your faithfulness and all that thy hand has provided. Father, I pray today that this truth would not merely be a song on our lips, but it would be the anchor of our souls, that our trust would be solely in you, for you alone are faithful. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. You may be seated. Good morning. My name is Paul, and I'm the lead pastor here at Cross Point, and it is an honor and a privilege to be here with you guys today. We're in the middle of a series that we kicked off a few weeks ago called Make War. And I know for some people, when they hear that topic or that title, Make War, they say, well, wait a second. Isn't this the church? Aren't we supposed to be a little bit kindler and gentler and a little bit different? And the reality is this that there are some things that are worth fighting for. The problem is that we don't always know what those are or how to fight. That there are some things that are worth fighting for. There are some things where God is passionate and wants you and I to take a stand. He doesn't want us to just sit back and be passive. But the reality that most of us forget or miss in this moment is that we fight the wrong thing. We end up fighting each other. We end up fighting against instead of fighting for. And so over the last few weeks as we've been diving in and talking about this idea of what are the things that God actually wants us to fight for? And how are the ways that we are to fight? Because we don't fight like the world does. We don't fight and wage war. Our weapons are kindness. And they are compassion. But our convictions are compelling, and we stand firm in those truths. So through this, we've been looking at one of the most famous battles in all of time, right? It's a battle that whether you have grown up in church or you've never been to church, whether you're from this nation or another nation, you have heard the story. In fact, this battle is so famous that even the names of the warriors involved evoke images in all of our minds, and it is the fight between David and Goliath. It is the fight between David and Goliath. Even the names invoke in our minds an image or an understanding. And so over the next few moments, we're kind of just going to set the stage of the battle, of who was there and what are the implications of this setup for you and I for the battles that we face and the situations and circumstances we find ourselves. So if you have your Bibles, would you turn in the Old Testament, that's the first half of the Bible, to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 17. So go ahead and turn in there, or if you've got a Bible app on your phone, go ahead and fire that up, because we got jam-up Wi-Fi in this space. Or just follow along with the words on the screen, or there's a stack of free Bibles in the back of the room. That's our gift to you. But let me kind of just set it up as we dive in here now to 1 Samuel chapter 17, starting in verse 1 and following. It says, Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war, and they assembled at Soka in Judah. Now let me tell you who the Philistines were. The Philistines were a bunch of people who had occupied this land that God had given to the nation of Israel. The promised land that Moses had went and freed the people from slavery and that Joshua had led them into and that they conquered. This promised land that belonged to them, there were also some people there called the Philistines and they weren't too excited about their new neighbors. And so the Bible tells us that they gathered their forces for war and they marched to Soka in Judah. They went into the Israelite territory to make war. And the Israelites were like, yo, dude, what are you doing? I just, what are you, why, what's going on? We just got this great deal off of Zillow. Back off, right? It says, and they, they pitched their camps at Ephes and at Damon and at Soka and Ezekiel. So let me put this into perspective. It'd be like if like Pasco County decided they want to start some static with Hernando. 
right? And they don't just come up in here, but they're going to pitch the camp, and they're going to pitch it in Brooksville. They got some troops in Spring Hill. You could throw some in the Royal Highlands and Wikiwachi. And right now, Hernando Beach is like, we're safe. Aha. No, just kidding, right? Like, so, like, these people have come to do war, and they are moving into their area, to their territory. Now, it says that King Saul, in verse 2, Saul assembled the Israelites, and they camped at the Valley of Elah, and they drew up the battle line to meet the Philistines. So, King Saul says to his army, come on, we got to go. We're being invaded. We need to get ready. And says, so the Philistines, they occupied one hill, and the Israelites the other, and there was a valley in between them. And if you know anything about tactics and military strategy, the reason they did this is because you always want the high ground. So the Philistines, they got there first and they took this high ground. And the Israelites got there and King Saul says, well, we ain't going down in the valley, we're gonna take this high ground. So the Israelites got high ground here, the Philistines got high ground here, and in between them is the valley that nobody wants to be in. And so at this moment, they've got their battle lines drawn, the armies are there, And then the Bible tells us we are introduced to the bad guy, the baddest of the bad guys. In verse 4, it says, a champion named Goliath. Now, let me tell you what the champion meant. The champion meant that he was the biggest, baddest, best, most awesome soldier and warrior that that nation had. And back in those days in ancient times, there was always one warrior who would emerge out of all the others that this was the person. And sometimes as there was a custom, a champion from one army would challenge the champion of another army. We're going to talk about that in just a few moments. But so it says this champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, because you guys all care, right, came out of the Philistine camp. And it says that his height was six cubits and a span. And we're all like, huh, six cubits and a span. No idea what that means. But don't worry, I'll explain that later. But I just want to kind of tell you a little bit about Goliath. So Goliath shows up, and he's a big dude. He's a six-cubit dude and a span. And it says that he has a helmet of bronze on his head. And he had a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. Again, you're all impressed. 5,000 shekels is like over 120 pounds. So this dude shows up and his armor weighs a middle schooler, right? And it says that on his legs he had bronze greaves and he had a bronze javelin strung over his back and his spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and the iron point on it weighed 600 shekels. And his shield bearer went ahead of him. And so Goliath marches out and he stands there and he shouts to the ranks of Israel. And he says, why do you come out and line up for battle but you're not doing nothing. He says, am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Then choose a man and have him come down to me. And if he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. So he goes down there and he does what was customary of the day. Instead of everybody going to war and dying in this battle, he says, here's how we'll do it. We'll just solve it man to man, mano y mano. Come on down. You send your best guy out. We'll fight. Winner take all. And he says, I, he goes on, the Philistine says, spies this day the army of Israel. He's like, give me a man and let us fight each other. Listen to verse 11. It says, on hearing the Philistines' words, Saul, the king, And all of the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. They were scared to death. This dude was massive, right? So the nation's at war. Goliath is huge. And everybody's scared. Now I want to kind of put this into perspective so you can understand that. So here is a rendering of Goliath. That's pretty accurate. Goliath, those six cubits and a span, he was over nine feet tall. The the screen is nine feet. He was actually technically a little bit bigger than that. Nine feet. If anybody's asking, I'm 5'11". Just put that into perspective, right? So, and, and that's if we go with like an 18 or 19 inch measure of a cubit. They, they're not 100% sure because a cubit could be up to 21 inches. So if that's the case, then Goliath was actually 11 feet tall. He was massive. Now, I know you're still thinking, I don't understand. How big is that? 
Well, let me just show you how big Goliath was relative to David. There we go. It's like Mac and me. Hi, right? That's a big dude. Now, that little David there, he's like five foot two. The average man of that time was only about five six. Little bitty compared to me, right? And Goliath was over nine and a half feet, maybe even upwards of 11 feet tall. And you may be thinking, that's a big dude. And you're like, oh, thank goodness I don't got to fight any 11 foot giants. But the reality is you and I have Goliaths, don't we? We got situations. We got circumstances. We got pasts. We got presence. We got people in our life. We got some things that we're facing that might as well be nine and a half feet tall. And we find ourselves in those situations where we are scared to death by it. And maybe it's not this big giant coming out there and shouting out at us, but maybe it was the diagnosis she got last week. Maybe it was the papers you got served last month. Maybe it was a situation or a circumstance where you are just caught off guard and you are in the midst of it. And what you thought was going to be this great life for God all of a sudden now is a massive giant before you. And if you're honest, you're scared. And you're caught off guard. You're angry. You may be doubting. And in the midst of this moment, what do you do? I mean, in the whole nation, all the army, the soldiers, the best warriors of Israel, even the king himself, they were scared too. I know that there are those moments that come that rock our faith to the core and you literally feel like you are on one side and there is this valley and then there is this massive giant. And you're sitting there and you're saying, God, when are you going to come through? When are you going to take care of the situation? When are you going to be the God that I know That I don't want to just be the God that we sing about your your, your past faithfulness. I want you to be the God who's faithful in the present. God, when are you going to fix the wrong? When are you going to fight and slay the giant for me? When are you going to do that, God? And so in this moment, as you're sitting there thinking, I want to introduce to you the other character of our story. And his name was David. And so as we kind of fast forward just a few verses from where we left off in verse 16... Right, We find a little bit more about what Goliath is doing, and then we're going to find out what David's up to. And it says, for 40 days, every single day, Goliath put on his battle armor, grabbed his giant spear, and he would walk out there every morning and evening, twice a day, because he was thorough. Right? And he took his stand, and he would stand there, and he would challenge them every single day. He'd go out there, and he'd be like, send me a warrior to fight. Send me a man. And you know, after 40 days, he probably got creative and he was putting some great stuff out there on Facebook, right? And he was calling all kinds of names. He's mocking them. He's mocking their king. He's mocking their God. And he's just out there day after day after day. And nobody had the courage to fight him because they were all scared because you look at him and you are intimidated and you are overwhelmed. And it says, now Jesse, that was David's dad, Now, Jesse said to his son, David, he goes, I want you to take an ephah of roasted grain and 10 loaves of bread to your brothers and hurry to the camp. Now, let's just put this into perspective. So David, when we met him, when he was anointed king, uh, the Bible, and it doesn't really say clearly, but historically scholars said that when he was anointed king, he was probably about eight to 12 years old. We'll just meet in the middle. We'll call that 10, shake on it. It's a deal, okay? So he's about 10 years old. And at this time in David's life, when he gets this task from his dad, he's about 15. So about five years have gone on from when he was anointed king to this moment. And so his brothers have gone off to war. Some of his older brothers, some of those impressive guys that Samuel had seen on that day that he anointed king, some of those guys had gone off to war. And the war, the battle was happening close enough to where they lived that he could send David down there to bring his sons some Lunchables, right? Because he knows, maybe Jesse had experience, he knows if you've ever been in the military, the food ain't that good, right? And so he says, listen, would you bring, he says, I want you to take some, some bread because I know how much when your brothers go to war, they like to carb load. So here, bring them some bread. And then he goes, now listen, but he's a smart dad, right? So he says this, now also I want you to take along 10 cheeses to the commander of their unit. 
Because let's be honest, who doesn't like a nice charcuterie board? You know what I'm saying? And so like some of you guys are wondering right now, why am I not getting ahead in life? Why is God not opening doors? Have you brought your boss 10 cheeses lately? I'm just saying, everybody loves cheese. Try that tomorrow when you go to work. Be like, hey boss, I brought you cheese. Maybe that might be the key to your promotion. Don't know. But now let's think about little David, right? Little David is super pumped at this moment because David's dad comes to him and says, listen, I got a job for you. I want you to do something. And he's like, yeah, because my older brother's at war. And what kid doesn't love that, right? All little boys grow up and they want to play. They want to be a soldier. They want to fight. He's like, this is great. I'm going to go down there. What do you got, dad? What do you got, dad? What do you got, dad? He goes, I want you to bring them some bread. Say, what? (laughs) Oh, yeah, and don't forget the cheeses. And here's David, man. He's been waiting five years for his shot, five years and an opportunity. There's invaders. There's a war. This is my time. I'm the man. I'm the king. And you want me to do DoorDash? Come on, Dad. Come on, God. It says, and here's why. Because they were with Saul and all the men of Israel in the Valley of Elah fighting the Philistines. And David's like, this is the best you got? This is the job? This is what you want? But you know what the Bible says? He doesn't actually say any of that. They say that Jesse went to David and asked him to do something. And so David did it. Even though five years earlier he was anointed as king, even though he knew he had more capability, he wasn't just to be Uber Eats. He was to be a leader of the nation. But yet he was given this task. And the question I have for you, if you find yourself in one of those situations where you feel like there's this big valley and there's a giant standing there and you don't know how you're going to slay him, you don't know how to overcome him, the question is this, as you're waiting on God to do this great thing, is maybe has God asked you to do some little thing that you thought you're just too good to do? Have you been like, well, God, do you don't understand? Don't you notice in my resume? Haven't you seen my LinkedIn profile? I'm a somebody. I like I'm way beyond like being a door greeter at Crosspoint. Like you want me to work in children's ministry with the little kids? They drool. Like don't you know who I am, God? Don't you know what I'm capable of? God, I am so much better than this. Why don't you give me an assignment and a mission that's worth what I can do? Because you're a warrior. You were made to make war. And yet, Jesse comes to his son and says, but this is what I need you to do right now. And I think for most of us, if we're honest, that maybe in the season of waiting, maybe in the midst of the middle of where we're at, maybe as we face our giants, we're worried about how God's going to do this big thing, and God's over here saying, but can I trust you with this little thing? Because it's in our faithfulness to the little things that the heart of the warrior is developed. It's in our ability to do just what King David did when he was just shepherd boy David. It's in that moment where we get the heart that's humble, that's a servant, that's patient, and that's faithful, that will then set us up for the next thing. See that in this moment, the faithfulness of David to just bring these breads and these cheeses to his brother and their commander is what actually put him in place to do battle with Goliath. And that maybe what God is trying to say is like, hey, yeah, there's an enemy over there. There's a thing. There's a diagnosis. There's a situation. There's a circumstance. And I know, listen, that battle is coming, but you won't be ready for it if we don't deal with your pride or your ego or your arrogance or the other things that I'm telling you we need to work on right now in your heart. If I can't trust you to run an errand for me, why would I trust you to lead the nation? And you're over here and you're you're getting frustrated, but in the waiting, are you becoming? Are you becoming who God wants you to be? Because I know we're all eager for the fight and for the victory, but God's over here saying, yeah, but it's the preparation that's going to set you up to be victorious. 
It's the faithfulness here that's going to make you successful there. In fact, Jesus talked about this in Luke chapter 16. He tells a parable of what it's like in God's kingdom. And he says this truth. He says, listen, if you are faithful with little things, then you'll be faithful with larger ones. In other words, if I can trust you with the small things, if I can trust you with the things that might not be so glamorous, if I can trust you with the things that might seem beneath you, but you do it with the right heart and the right attitude and the right spirit, it will place you where you need to be for the greater things of the kingdom. That if I can trust you here, it'll set you up for success there. Because who's the one who anointed David king? It was God who picked him. God knows what it's going to take for David to go from the pasture to the palace. He knows what it's going to take for him to be the shepherd of the animals to being the shepherd and the leader of an entire nation. And he picked David. Why? Because he had the heart of a warrior. Because he was willing to be humble. He was willing to be patient. He was willing to become a servant. He was willing to be faithful with little things. So God knew he could trust him with big things. And over the next few weeks as we dive in and we see the story and the battle, everybody loves the moment where there's the victory, but nobody looks at the preparation that it took to get there. And we admire all these great people and their wonderful accomplishments in our life. In the world that we live in, but we don't know about all the hard work and failures and faults and small things that it took to get there. Everybody wants to be an overnight success that takes 10 to 15 years to build. And we all think it's going to happen like that. And God's over here saying, man, give me your heart and be faithful with little and see what I will do to set you up for bigger, greater things. If you are faithful with little things, you'll be faithful with larger ones. But that verse goes on and says, but if you're dishonest with little things, you won't be honest with greater things. And some people are sitting there saying, well, God, man, why don't you bless me with a couple million dollars? And God's like, you haven't tithed off the first hundred I gave you. Psh, mic drop. No, it's, just kidding. And we're over here wondering why God's not giving us this thing. And God's over here saying, I've given you this, though. Show me I can trust you here with this small thing in the kingdom. And I'll trust you with more. In fact, for some of us, that when we understand this principle that, listen, being faithful in the small things, it echoes large in God's kingdom. Being faithful with small things here on earth, man, it echoes large in the kingdom. And you know the first thing that God asks you to be faithful with and trust him with? It's your soul. Of all the things that God could give you, bless you with, and entrust you with, he gave you your soul. And he said, what are you going to do with that? Will you trust me with your soul? Will you trust me with your salvation? Will you trust me with your faith? Because it's the first most important step of trust. And for some of us, man, we've been running, we've been hiding, we've been fighting, we've been making war against God instead of surrendering to him. And we've been saying, God, I can't, I can't, I can't give up control. And God's over here saying, you never had control. If you had control, you wouldn't need Jesus. If you had control, you wouldn't sin. If you had control, you wouldn't make mistakes. There wouldn't be pain in your life caused by other people. But what you can have is salvation. And you can have freedom. And you can have hope. You can have forgiveness. But you gotta trust me with the soul first and maybe that's you this morning maybe as you're sitting here watching this online maybe that's what God's saying to you this first step of faith is to trust him with salvation in fact as we wrap up our teaching time that's our first next step to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior to surrender your life to Christ to stop running from, to stop fighting, to stop ignoring the Holy Spirit of the living God that is drawing you to a place of peace, of forgiveness, of hope, and of a future. And you're wondering why God hasn't trusted you with other things. He's trusted you with this most precious gift, your soul. It doesn't belong to anybody else. It doesn't have anybody else's hands on it. Only you control it. He's saying, will you trust me with that first? And see what I could do with the rest of your life. Trust me with that and see what I have 
in store for you. And so if that's you this morning, I want to invite you to make that decision, to take that first step of trust. So here's what I'm asking. Everybody bow your heads and close your eyes. Nobody looking around, no distractions. And if you want to give your life to Christ, if you want to accept him, if you want to take that first step of trusting him with the small, believing him for this, the Bible says that you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. And so I'm gonna invite you in that prayer right now. As I pray out loud, you pray right where you are. Dear God, here I am, and I surrender my life, my soul to you, all that I was, all that I am, all that I will ever be. I lay my life before you, and I confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. And I pray now, Father, upon this confession of faith that you fill me now to the fullness of your Holy Spirit, that you lead, guide, teach, and direct me from this day forward, and that your faithfulness in all things flows from your faithfulness in this, that as I surrender my life to you, you alone, you will forever accept, hold, lead, guide, and bring me home on my last day. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And if you prayed that prayer, would you go ahead and take out one of those connect cards that Pastor Doug talked about earlier in the service and check that next step? And for everybody else here, if you've already put your faith in Christ, the second next step that we have says this. It says, I will, and then there's a blank. What is it that the Holy Spirit spoke to you today was your next step? As we talked about this idea of making war, and here's King David who's now become a teenager, and God wants to utilize him, but it's not the big war task. It's not that monumental thing. It's a small thing. What's the small thing that God's asking you to do? What's that next step that God's telling you in your faith? That step of obedience. What's the small things that God's telling you to do in your marriage? What's the small things God's telling you to do at work? What's the small things God's telling you to do in your faith or in your church? Would you take that next small step and see if he doesn't open up doors later on when you're ready and his time is right? for miraculous victories where he'll get all the credit and he gets the accolades. Third next step. Just talking about a bunch of great opportunities that we have for you to grow in your faith. And it says, I will sign up for, and one of the things we hear, we have a fight night for our men, which is coming up on Thursday of this week. Where are my men at? Come on now. Get loud. It's in church. It's okay. This is a church where you can make some noise. And I love this, too, because coming up in December, we also have a women's night of worship. And, and I saw these graphics, and I just thought, ain't that the epitome of men and women? Right? Like, the men's one is, like, all masculine. Like, yeah, fight night! Woo! And then you have, like, woman's night of worship, hope in the waiting. And it's, like, you can almost smell it, right? Like, <laughs> like, just looking at that graphic, it's like walking into, like, Bath and Body Works or something, right? And then, like, over here, you look at the man, like, yeah! Men! But here's the reality. I don't see any of y'all pulling out your phones and scanning that QR code and signing up. There's my brother right there. All right, I see that. Right there. Come on, guys. You know, as men, we've been talking about it. We kicked off our last fight night a couple months ago. Is that as men, man, God has called us to fight for our faith, to fight for our family, and to fight for our brothers. And we want to equip you and set you up for success. And it's Thursday night right here. We're going to have fight night. You can sign up right there. And then about six weeks later, ladies, we got a women's night of worship for you. Go ahead and sign up for that. Now, here's what I want to let you know, fellas. The women have already outnumbered us by double on signups for their event. That's six weeks away. And ours is like three days away. So I can only come to one of two conclusions. Women are better with technology or men are lazy in last minute. Come on, fellas. In six weeks, those women are going to be worshiping, but let them see men who are leading their families. Men who will step up and stand apart and say, you can count on me. 
to lead our families to Jesus. I want to see you guys here, and I want you to bring some of your friends. This is going to be an awesome opportunity. There's a couple other things that we got going on, especially this week. We've got our discovery class on Wednesday night. Our discovery class is our membership class. That's just where you get to hear about the heartbeat of Crosspoint, about who we are and what we're doing and a little bit about where we came from and what God is doing. And I would love for you to be there. It's just kind of an informal thing, but here's the great news. We got free child care for you. And if you come, I'll be there. And I'm just going to kind of share the story of, of Crosspoint, of what God is doing and how you can be a part of it and go from an attender to being a member here. And then next week, we got the Halloween roast coming up. The Halloween roast, man, it's our biggest outreach event of the year. It is the only day of the year where our neighbors come to us. And we have an opportunity on that night when everybody else is handing out candy to hand out hope. On that night where you may not even know any neighbors that live around you, you can get to meet them all. And you can get to stand there and be light in the midst of their darkness. And we got about 10 locations all throughout our county in really strategic neighborhoods where there are tons of families and trick-or-treaters. And we're going to bring our grill to the driveway. We're going to grill up some hot dogs. We're going to chill some waters and some sodas. And we're going to hand those out to mom and dad so that we can connect with them while we give the kids candy. But more importantly, we offer hope to all of them. Because we are the church. And we're not going to stand by idly and leave our community struggling for hope. Real hope, the only hope of the world, is Jesus Christ. And he has entrusted us to be his messengers. Would you sign up and we'll get you connected with a location? You say, hey, listen, I don't know how to host or anything. That's okay. We got a ton of locations that could use some manpower. We would love for you to be a part of that. Last next step. I will memorize Luke 16.10. Those words of Jesus which echo this principle that we see played out here in David's life. Jesus said, if you are faithful with little things, you'll be faithful with much. David didn't gripe. David didn't complain. He was a teenager. He could have looked at his dad and be like, oh, Dad, come on. Really? Oh. Parents, can you relate to that? You ever get that? Right? But David didn't. David packed up 10 loaves of bread a billion cheeses, I don't know, right? Just grabbed that sack lunch, grabbed those Lunchables and went on his way to war thinking all he was doing was bringing his brothers and their commanders some food. Little did he know what God was gonna do. But he was faithful with little and God would turn him into a giant slayer. God's destined you and me to slay giants, but he's gotta see us be faithful to even get to the battle by doing the little things that bring him honor and glory and transform our heart and soul. Would you memorize those words? If you are faithful with little things, you'll be faithful with larger things. Listen, it's been an honor and a privilege to share this message and this time. And I'm gonna wrap us up with some prayer and I'll look forward to seeing you guys at some of those great events. Discovery class, if you wanna know more about the church, we have less than 20 spots left for that on Wednesday. Fight night if you're a dude, high school senior or above, 55-year-old, wherever. If you are a dude, you got breath in your lungs, be here on Thursday night. Ladies, your event's coming. It'll smell great. It'll be awesome. <laughs> you got plenty of time to get all your friends here. We would love these opportunities to help you grow. And maybe these are just the simple, small things. God's saying to get out of your comfort zone, to step out, and to become all in. I love you guys and it's an honor and privilege to be here today. Let's pray, wrap up our time and let our team come out and close us with worship. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this time. And God, as we have come and we have worshiped, as we have listened and heard and studied your word, Father, we know that you are faithful. And that regardless of the Goliaths, regardless of the giants that we face, that when you speak, we obey. And that when we follow you in the little things, when we are obedient with the little things, God, that we know that blessing always comes after that obedience. 
And so, God, the giants that may be in our life, the situations, the circumstances, the things we are facing that are out of our control and our power are completely within your control and your power. And in the waiting, Father God, I pray that we wouldn't waste that time, but that we would prepare. I pray that we wouldn't miss out on the opportunities to be faithful with the little things that might seem insignificant, but those are the things that build our character, that refine our integrity, and that give us the heart of the warrior so we can do battle as a warrior. God, I pray that in all these things that we would respond in obedience to your leading and that we would know That if we could trust you, then, Father, you will trust us with even greater. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.